Welcome to Standard Intelligence, your resource for competitive constructive magic in the UK. This is episode 56 for the week beginning the 26th of November 2018. I'm Dr. Jack Patton. And I'm Simeon Beaver. This episode is brought to you in part thanks to our supporters on our Patreon. Many thanks to those of you who have made a contribution. It is immensely appreciated by both of us. And as we've hit our first Patreon goal, we're doing giveaway each month of a standard playable card. Anyone who is our supporter on Patreon by the 4th of December, that's coming up soon, will be eligible for the December draw. If you'd like to be in it or would like to learn more about how to support us, please head over to patreon.com forward slash SICast. We're joined this week by a special guest, PPTQ winner Helena Brake. Helena, thanks for joining us. Why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners? So yeah, my name's Helena. I play Magic in Manchester. Um, I've been playing since 1999, so that's Portal Second Age. Wow. <laughs> which is quite a while now, um, although mm. I was only kind of casually been playing competitively since around Return to Ravnica. Um, kind of known in the Northwest for being either the person playing the nonsense or just playing the, playing the control deck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, well, I, people, will, people who are familiar with the, with the podcast will know me as the person who kept playing the Combat Celebrant gift deck with Madcap Experiment in it um, in the Roger and Rivals of Ixalan season. <laughs> yes. yes, I was actually going to say, I, th- I think yours was the first version of that list that I looked at and went okay someone's actually thought about this like we had the we had the season before like someone came up with a black red version of the combat celebrant thing and they were like oh it's so goofy and funny and all in and just didn't work like uh-huh. 90% of the time and then your list looked super consistent because it was mostly just blue red gift that occasionally went oh and by the way I combo kill you I mean I, um, I once I once on playing online mulligan to three and my opponent just went turn seven cast approach of the second son and I cast a and they died um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean uh, and, and, yeah. and, um, uh, what I was going to say about that deck in general was that because um, it was actually consistent because you just, all of the deck was just draw spells like instead of mm. playing like the creature package that you had to play to make gate to the afterlife work you could yeah. just play draw spells and just go here's the refurbish you're dead so, yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. I, that was that was the strength of the white in that in yeah, that deck, and yeah. I think that's what pulled it away from being, as you say, as inconsistent as the as the blue red version that actually yeah. became very popular. It for did, a time. yeah. The top eight, three topics, copies top eight, one GP, if I remember correctly. The white also I got these sideboard right. cards as well. Funny story, actually, because. You it first got noticed when it 5 0 on Magic Online. You mentioned that in one of your casts. Yes, um, yes, yeah. I had bought um, 20 copies of Combat Celebrant on Magic Card Market for 20 cents each uh, and traded them all into um, Magic Madhouse along with some other st- nonsense I had lying around and got a Volcanic Island. So Wow. <laughs> why, why, why Modo 5 0 would spike the price enough for me to trade in my 25 cent cards for a Volcanic Island? So there you go. There you go, folks. Folks listening at home. Find a, find a bad mythic, break it, and sell it for profit. <laughs> I was going to say, that sounds like insider trading level shenanigans. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah um, that's me. <laughs> right then. Okay, with that, let's get into the news. So, this past weekend we've actually had a rather interesting event the magic artists the the artists that produce all of the 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 art on your cards um many of them have banded together and are boycotting what will be from next year magic fest events while currently grand prix um, the primary reason for this uh, has basically boiled down to the reduction in what the gp runners are giving them giving these artists as a you know compensation for traveling spending time away from their work from their loved ones and not getting to to do anything but you know sit at an artist booth and and meet fans it's that they are effectively working for the the gp runners um and this last uh note basically from channel fireball that has rather converted them into vendors it it feels like they would be paying for their own space and they would have to try and make that money back by selling their art um, rather goes against what a lot of them felt was their place in the community and I think a lot of us agree and that is when you go and see an artist you'd like to go and say hey I really love your art not necessarily can I buy a piece of art but sometimes but the overheads are never going to you know be clawed back by these artists and so it just means that what they're effectively doing is spending money to work for someone else 
and uh, a lot of very notable artists. You know, you can just look at the list and it's like all of these names have have uh, painted and drawn cards that I know. You know, it's it's an insane uh, cross section of the of the uh, community to basically be saying, look, guys, this is this is enough now. Um, we are effectively working for you, and we've done it in the past for things like flights, hotels, a break room so that we can you know store our stuff and and have a have a moment away, and then you know large tables with which to exhibit our art so that people can buy it, but we're also noting that no one ever really seems to turn a profit as an artist going to these events um so folks how do we feel about artists being treated this way and do we think they are overreacting or is this um in fact coming a little too little and too late should something have been done earlier uh well th- something should have been done earlier end of um but <laughs> I think part of it is they're not necessarily saying they want to have all of these perks. No. They're saying either treat us as guests and Mm -hmm. give us these perks or say that we're vendors so that the people coming to the event know that we are vendors, then we can charge properly for our things. Mm -hmm. And because at the moment they get complaints from the public who go, you have to pay to get you to sign a card. That seems ridiculous. Yeah. Not realising that they actually are paying for their flight, their hotel, their food, their their desk space. space I and mean, they get some uh, Channel 5 will have responded saying they get some desk, spa- desk space but essentially Channel 5 response is fairly pants yeah <laughs> Yeah, I uh, thought that. In the, yes, they get... Uh, and th- the trouble is that some of the things that are in the note from um, from Vorthos Mike are not 100% correct according to Channel Fireball. Things like mm-hmm. they're not paid to um, to uh, do events at... So some workshops and things. And that Channel Fireball have said, yes, they are. We've never mm-hmm. asked someone to do a workshop without paying them. Yes, yes. But the overall effect stands, I think, that they need to be one or the other and can't be treated as both. Yep. Yeah, I think with Channel Fireball's response was essentially just like we gave you the bare minimum. Is that oh, no, is that not enough? And I'm like, well, it's not been enough for the past however long. So you know. <laughs> so yeah. No. And then when you go, these are magic vests. They're meant to include people who don't want to come and play the main event. Mm. You think, well, if you want to make it a magic vest, don't you need to actually attract the people who create that magic vest? The the cosplayers, well, the artists, if, if all enough, of yeah. those. If anything, it's it's a, it's it, it, in my head, it doesn't make sense. They don't pay the artists to be there. Like, yeah, this is this is. T- time that they are yeah. spending interacting with fans on behalf of the convention and on behalf of magic as it's a whole they should channel... probably be getting paid well, yeah, channel people, people, also are going, yeah. people are going they to advertise people are going to your events to. yeah yeah because of these artists no absolutely um, well, well, they, they pay the guests of honour right but they don't uh, pay the regular artists is that what I'm thinking there, there are no guests there are no guests of honour anymore oh well no. there we go <laughs> yeah um, it's it's really interesting actually to see to see it uh, later out like this because I have been, um, you know, ancillarily a part of uh, science fiction conventions for the last few years, friends with a lot of people who run them and that kind of thing. And one of their biggest things is if we want big names to come to our convention and if we want them to say sit on panels for us and and do the things that actually cause people to want to come and want to spend money coming to our events surely uh, we give them free entry to the rest of the event so whatever spare time they have they can go and see say other writers movie runners whatever that they might be interested in hearing from and also you know you're paying for their them to come and to stay um you know even even student run events put up uh their guests of honors in accommodation and pay for their travel you Mm -hmm. know and then take them out to dinner generally the night of um and it's just it's really weird to see you know that side of things compared to magic which goes oh well it doesn't really matter they're you know they're just coming and they get to sell their stuff and it's like no they're coming they're taking a weekend out of doing anything they want to do some of them are magic players i think who was it um oh one of the artists at gp liverpool last year um noah bradley uh when he was on his time off went and played the actual events now imagine these artists wanted to come and play the main event and suddenly they're like well actually i suppose i better work that weekend you know and cfb's like well yeah you're working but no compensation it's like what why are you doing uh, this the thing that you said about the science fiction conventions obviously lots of us go to things like science fiction conventions Mm, and mm. and the like as magic, you know, 
the type of person who pay, plays Magic tends to be the type of person who likes that sort of event. Crossover is broad, yes. And we are very used to the people who are there as guests will be being paid to be there and will have been paid mm. given their hotels. And we're expecting the artists to have exactly the same thing. And so as consumers, we don't want to pay the artists because we think they're fleecing us at that point. Mm, mm. Uh, I, and it's like, no, having, actually, they're having, trying to recoup losses. Having seen all this, I'm, was, I'm almost like, actually, now I'm far more likely to go to uh, an artist at an event and get them to sign some cards and pay them for it because I'm happy they're there. Before, I didn't want yeah. to go and... I wasn't going to... It's not the thing I go to if, these events for, but no. I think the artists should be there. They add to the event, absolutely. Yes, I think I think we. It, it's interesting because there there was a similar argument what six months ago about cosplayers, and it's like no cosplayers are part of the event now. Um, yes, it wasn't that way when Magic GP started, but now they are part of the landscape and they make these events interesting. Seeing Khan wander around GP yeah. Birmingham was so cool, and it's the same with artists. Seeing them turn up and be like, "Here's my art," and you go, "Oh." Ah, oh, this is pretty. You know, seeing John Avon at Nationals and things like that was really cool. I don't want to lose that, especially, as you say, if we're trying to turn this into a magic fest and not just the main competitive event is the big deal and then all the rest of it that's going on is kind of medium and you don't care about it. No, we want the side things that are going on to actually be given more prominence. We actually, you know, from the sound of what Wizards has been trying to do, they want to turn the main event into a very, like, small part of it, in essence. They want to say, oh yeah, and there's this comp thing going on if you're, you know, if if you're a grinder, if you're that way inclined, yeah. Yeah, But if you just want to play some magic... You know. Yeah, because I think there's a, there's almost like a um kind of just like a uh, agreed like an unspoken agreement that Grand Prix are just this kind of competitive thing that people mm. are, competitive Magic players go to because they want to play some Magic and win some get some pro points, win some backs, and get some you know dual lands off the prize war. Whereas obviously if they're trying to market it more as this kind of all encompassing um potentially essentially it's essentially brand advertising you're trying to change yes. the trying to change the perception of your brand and if you're then doing that and then all the artists are going away you've they've, you've lost half of what you're trying to do like yeah. mm. it's it's completely um completely the opposite of the actual points of changing GPs into Magic Fest by doing so. And obviously part of the reason the artists have done this now is exactly that. That if you want to go to a Magic Fest, you're going to have to meet us somewhere mm. because we can we can stop this being a Magic Fest by refusing to go. If it was true, true. still a GP, the, then Channel 5 wouldn't go, right, fine, no artists. No, the people who are coming to a GP to play the main event don't care. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. No, that's... Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's so exactly sport, uh, we should say that Noah Bradley has said he's still going to attend that he yes. that he understands where everyone else is coming from but he's not going to boycott fair enough but he is in like the top three names of well this is, of this is it. at present it's like no bradley uh, uh, john avon and Therese nielsen probably yes exactly well this is it you can when you're that big you can just go well i'm going to show up and i'm going to tell people that i'm charging for their signatures and i'll then point at the queue and go i've got a lot of people to see so yeah. whereas you, you know, know that a lot of artists actually have no one at their desk for most of the event mm, mm. i mean yeah because I mean, right. the thing is that people like john avon and Therese nielsen know bradley they can go to a magic fest and they know they're going to make money because they're these big name players. they've got titus mm. lunter and like when he went to his first GP, it was one of the mind sports ones that they ruined. Um, was um, he had only done like some islands in the Khans of Tarkir set. It's my favorite island, but people were people didn't want him to be there. People were like he's only on a couple of art, card arts. What he's not even a big name. What is he going to be there for? And so obviously, if they're yeah. getting that kind of reaction from, they're never going to sell and make enough cards to make sell enough signatures to make the event even close to profitable. Yeah, um, and it's in the same. It's the same way that if you look at music festivals, for example, obviously you know Metallica and the Prodigy who are headlining these events are getting paid loads. The small bands still get paid. Like even the small bands, only a tiny fraction of the people are going to. They still get paid. Why are we not getting mm. the same kind of recompense for small artists at GPs? Like no, I, I yeah. absolutely agree. Agree. That's a very good way of looking at it. Um, yeah, talking of GPs, we we should mm-hmm. mention that it has been announced today that GP Liverpool has reached its cap. So if you're not already signed up for the main event, it is too late. However, if you're part of a team where the rest of your team have signed up and you haven't yet, uh, you need to contact info at cfbevents.com and they will sort it out. They haven't said how they'll sort it out yet, but apparently they will sort yeah. it out. Uh, if none of your team have registered, I think it's you're too late to be registered. 
Yeah. yeah. Speaking of highly um, attended GPs, uh, GP Warsaw last weekend had 1,836 players. They'd capped it five days before the event started. Um, they ran out of tables on day one to play side events. Yeah, um, yeah, I heard about this. And there were so many players uh, going into the last round. There was a guy on twelve one one Ted on table two who couldn't ID. Yeah, that is, that that is ridiculous. kind of insane, actually. As you say, I was I was seeing things on on Twitter about the fact that they're like, "Yep, we've closed all of our side events to anyone who isn't a fanatic badge holder." And then it's like the next day they're like, "Okay, we're gonna limited open up again." fanatic badge holders get preference and it's like wow when your side events are that oversubscribed was it the you know you've it's, got it's it. the main event being so oversubscribed isn't I mean it? the main event was oversubscribed as well but it was a sealed think... GP as well imagine the logistics of doing another 1,836 player sealed event That's I, a... wonder, I wonder if they pre reg the pools they did <gasps> oh did they I uh, so at weird. least they, at least they said they said they would because they someone asked them about pre-reg pools for another event. They said they're pre-regging all pools. Or someone asked about whether with two buys they would get pre-reg pool, and the reply was mm. that they are pre-regging all the pools. Wow, that's wow. absurd. That is absurd. Just I mean, I guess. Speaking, I'm also, did anyone you, hear about the GP Madrid? What it was a couple of years ago where they overbooked the GP and didn't tell anyone until they got to Madrid. Mm. No? Yeah. Oh, dear. I think it happened. Was it Eduardo Sanchez? I think it might have been, who'd paid for all his hotels and flights and stuff and then was told he couldn't play the events. Oh, God. Uh, that was Mind Sports International. That was Mind Sports, um, oh, uh, obviously. Yeah. I mean, this is this is the sort of thing that makes you go, yeah, I can understand why we've only got one GP runner at the moment. <laughs> like, yeah. when, when companies are willing to screw up like that and just, carry on with their lives and not say anything about recompense for your flights, your hotels or anything like that. Yeah, at some point you have to go, okay, we're going to have one person, they're going to know what they're doing each time and if they screw it up, we can hold them responsible. Um, yeah, you know? Fine. Of course, um, while, we're, while we're talking about Eduardo, uh, oh, yeah, we should congratulate him, him on his win. Yeah, absolutely, yes. absolutely. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. It's is didn't he also like top eight a standard GP last weekend? I want to say uh, very recently. I'm not sure if yeah. it was last weekend, yeah. but yes, because I think yes, he top eighted a standard and a limited one, but didn't play the PT because because he, he was on coverage. It. Yeah, exactly. Someone pointed this out on Twitter, and they were like. This is the level of player who should be doing the the color commentary on in the booth. Yeah, Eduardo's kind of, it's... yeah, Eduardo's kind of perfect for it as well because he's very kind of he's got a very kind of personable and yeah, mm. yeah, he's much more like. Unfortunately, you have loads of good players who they've tried to make commentary. Yes, not quite as uh, got the interpersonal skills, shall we say? Yes, absolutely. Whereas he's very approachable, very bubbly about magic, and very friendly, and so it comes across quite nicely in his commentary in his. Uh, analysis yeah. of you know plays and things but he still knows exactly what he's doing he's not just you know a good person to have in the booth to keep keep things moving whereas you know as as much as I love them Riley and Marshall they might not see the best lines mm-hmm. but they are quite good at keeping the conversation going so it's good to see good to see uh, Eduardo doing so well at things like that um, obviously I think he's still our um, play competitive he, he's, play he's representative one, he is one of the one competitive of, play representatives yeah. yes um, so yeah uh, uh, someone else made a in- uh, comment about it being interesting that of the three of them, two have basically said I'm taking a step back from competitive magic since they were announced as competitive play representatives. And it's like, yeah, but they still got it when they want to. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, not sure that works, although they do have the, the link still with mm. uh, the current professional players and from Eduardo's point of view with a lot of us who are not yet at that level. Yeah, yeah, you know, he's, uh, and he... Willie Adel was the same, that mm. he has a lot of links all the way down the chain mm. in South America as well. Right then, okay. I think that's basically all the news we wanted to talk about this week. Um, Shall we head into the PBTQ results? Let's do that. Sounds good. So we've actually only got one set of results from PBTQs this week, and it's actually from last weekend. Uh, we haven't had anyone's uh, deck list come through yet this week, so we're going to talk about this one that we actually missed from last week. Um, unfortunately, nothing nothing new from this weekend, but we are talking to a, a winner, so we can we can have a discussion in the deep dive about what that that tournament felt like and and what yeah. the the meta game seemed like. I do I do remember all of the deck all of the list all of the decks that were in the top eight. 
like as well, so I can give you a kind oh, of good. overview as well. Yeah, excellent. Perfect. Yes. Um, so at the Games Den last weekend on the 17th, uh, the winner was the Mono Blue Tempo deck. Uh, still a very interesting deck. Uh, still, I think, requires hitting a Curious Obsession to basically be very powerful, but once it does, it looks kind of strong, actually. Yeah. And um, it is basically, we've seen it twice. It's won, but on both occasions. Yeah. It has been played at other events, it just ha- hasn't made top eights. Absolutely. Uh, the runner up slot was taken up by a Golgari mid range list. In the semi finals, we've got a Selesnia tokens. Do you want me to say a... Ghost Selesnia? I, ex- I was expecting a woo from Simeon there. <laughs> woo! Yeah. Ghost Selesnia. Uh, <laughs> uh, the other semi-finalist was a Mono Red Frenzy. Now we get to the quarterfinals where things get a little interesting. We've got a Jeskai Control, we've got a Mono Red Flame of Kill deck, and then two more Mono Red Frenzy decks. So that's three Frenzy lists and a Flame list in this top eight. I'm looking at the, looking is... at the Flame list. It looks almost identical to the one, the, the 60 is only one card different from the list that won the Modo PTQ. Yeah, yeah, that that seems about right. Let me uh, let me grab it up. Uh, da, 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 da. Minus one flame of kill plus one lava coil yeah, oh, yeah. i can see why you put lava coil into the main i, I yeah. actually yeah. run more than one lava coil at the moment yeah absolutely yeah no so uh the it looks like these red lists are starting to to really coalesce into basically what everyone agrees is the right thing to do apart from jerry t who still thinks we should be playing more risk factors and less uh um less frenzies but well, so you know. that's what the flame list is is the risk factor and flame instead of frenzy yeah um, I think I would still go Frenzy if I was playing red. Well, I told you about my turn of killing three angels and putting 20 yes, power on the board. You have. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. The card is completely broken. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah. We also... Um, oh, no. Sorry. I was about to say, we also have a, a, a metagame breakdown, but we, we don't. We don't for that one, I'm afraid. No, sadly. No. Um, we've got a modern check-in, but we'll do that at the bottom of the show, I think, folks. And we'll, um, we'll have a quick rundown of uh, the modern going on at Harlequins in Preston last weekend um actually i tell you what uh helena why don't you tell us the top eight from your pptq and we can yeah, have a listen to that absolutely so yeah, i i was the it. winner with jess guy planeswalkers uh the second place was the person who i went with in the car we went in the car together we're both undefeated in the swiss and met in the final on mono red frenzy uh the semi-final was semi-finalists were blue red drakes and mono red frenzy uh and then the rest of the top eight was jess guy control um blue red drakes blue red drakes and black green range wow a lot of a lot of drakes in there that's uh that's interesting to see i mean the deck looks extremely powerful so i don't it doesn't surprise me too much it's just interesting to see three of them making it into the top eight. i wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the tournaments are underrepresented in blue red drakes just because people are trying to struggle to get phoenixes together they're expen- yeah. people don't want to trade them and they are expensive they are yes and unlike the the other phoenix uh, the rekindling phoenix they're not easy to car- easy to put into every deck. They go in a specific style of deck, and if you're not running it, the price tag looks a little bit excessive. Exactly, and they're from and it's from the most recent set, whereas all the other money mythics are all from old sets, which have been opened more mm-hmm. and have been around longer, and people just have kind of naturally gravitated towards the cards more often. So that's might be probably my reason because I actually think the Drake's deck is probably really well positioned. Mm, as do I actually. It seems to squash me a lot on arena. So um, yes. Agree. It's- it's definitely very, very popular on Arena. Well, when myth where mythics aren't clue, have quite the price tag they're doing. No, yeah, they're... Online or in real life. <laughs> all, all, myth, exactly. all mythics cost the same, don't they? So. Yep, exactly. And if everyone's starting from zero, there's no point getting the older mythics. In fact, you're de-incentivized to try and get the older mythics Correct, because yeah. they'll be gone first. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think that's where we're seeing a lot of the innovation come from. Actually, I'll tell you what was really interesting. Going back to um, the GP and arena uh eduardo pointed out that his only limited testing was on arena which he did he did no limit he did like a couple of paper drafts i think he said he drafted twice on modo and never played the games and he did all of his testing on arena which i think is really interesting to think about yeah i remember bbd and brad nelson said they only test on arena for the standard pro tour yeah, yeah. Like, I think I think it's time to start recognising that there's a lot of data to be mined out of Arena that we just can't get our hands on right now, um, which is a real shame, actually. We've no, we've no way of, like, getting 5-0 lists out or anything like that. 
I think a lot of interesting space is going un, unexplored. But that's that's a conversa- a deeper conversation for another time. I just wanted to throw that out there while we were talking about Arena. Um, but yeah, as you said, uh, Helena, you took what you're calling Jeskai Planeswalkers. Correct, yeah. And um, I really want to talk about why you went with this list and, and that sort of thing. So I think, why don't we head into the deep dive and you can tell us all about your testing process and, and how you came to, to this deck. Okay, absolutely, not a problem. Uh, essentially, where it all starts was last season I was playing Jeskai Control, um, as always. <laughs> um, you, can, you can watch me play it in GP Copenhagen, I'm on YouTube. Um, not that I'm plugging myself or anything. But essentially, um, there's my big feeling is that four-cost draw spells are not playable in Standard. I don't think they're good enough, especially not mm-hmm. in the design space that Wizards are in, where we're playing very kind of pressure oriented format. And people are trying to. Mm-hmm. I think people are generally wise to the fact that you cast your spells into the four cost turn, into the form when your control point has four mana open when they want to cast their draw spell, but you want them to cast their cancel. Uh, so yep. people are playing around that, and Chemist's Insight's too slow, it's too clunky. Um, so I was playing Divination in that deck. And so what happens is, fast forward to Harlequin's Blackpool, my top eight list from that one, was playing four Divination, was playing one Khan, one Treasure Map, and some Tef- four Sefries, and then mm. a, a Hawatli and a Ral. Um, We'll come to Watley in a second. It's one of the interesting parts of the deck. Yeah. Um, but essentially from that event, like, Divination was fine, but uh, there was a couple of turns where it was a bit clunky with what I was trying to do. Because I don't play, mm. I also don't play any three-cost counter spells in any of my lists at the moment. Mm. Cause... No, I noticed that. You're, you're running some syncopates and some negates, basically. Correct, yeah. In, so, in this list. So what happened was, in that Harlequins event, I realised that the one treasure map and the one card I was playing were incredible. They were, like, the turns where you went map into, map or encounter into Clarity into Khan felt unlosable because um, mm. it's such a strong beginning and you're playing Khan on an empty board essentially a lot of the time um, and then so it evolved from this that was playing four treasure map three Khan and then from that it changed into much more of a like a tap out mid range your control list because yeah. in general, the problem at the moment I have with control decks is that people aren't winning the game. You see it from Adrian Sullivan's list from the last GP, and he's like, um, Niv Miss, it's such a powerful card. We want to put it in play, yeah. win the game, and turn the corner quicker. Uh, yes. And people are too busy trying to dirtle around because people like dirtling. And I'm not, I'm a fan of it as well, but I also like winning games of magic. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get you on that one. <laughs> so, so exactly. So it, it came to this point where once you've put the cons and the treasure maps in your deck, and you're playing this sort of essentially what is an artifact sub theme. Uh, mm. um, my when I last played the deck, Ral felt kind of bad because I cut down on the number of instants and sorceries. So yes. I changed Ral to Tezzeret, and Tezzeret was absurd because you flip a map and you draw two cards every turn. And so essentially it became this tap out style control deck that turns the corner quickly with Khan tokens and all that kind of thing. Um, so that comes round to my my theory behind why I think you shouldn't be playing cancel in your control decks. So this specifically ties into the Jeskai control against blank green matchup, where Deafen and Clarion mm-hmm. kills every creature that you care about apart from Golgari Fund Broker. Yeah. And dis- disdainful stroke counters everything that you care about. The problem yes. is, is that if you're trying to like cancel your opponent's six cost Frasca or their Vivian Reed and place three mana to wipe the board, you have to wait until you turn need to six. wait until turn six. Yeah. And the difference between turn five and turn six is you're dead. That's literally like yeah. the clock that they get from turn two Branch Walker, turn three Jade Light, turn four something else kills you on turn six, but doesn't kill you on turn five. Um, hmm. So the difference between playing two cost counter spells and three cost counter spells is massive when you're leaning so heavily on deafening parry. We've seen from all of the Jeskai control lists of the recent past, they're all just playing for Clarion because you need to. Um, yeah. And as you see from my list, I, I play four copies of Disdainful Stroke in the sideboard. Um, I was going to say, I absolutely love that with with your plan of like, okay, well, what I'm, what I'm sort of controlling the game with is Wraths. So the only thing I have to worry about is big things and non-creature spells. So in your main board, having the negate to deal with anyone uh-huh. doing anything uh-huh. controlly, where your wraths don't look so good, and then obviously the same for strokes in the sideboard. I think that's just excellent deck building right there. Yeah, and the other thing about two-cost counter spells is you can cast them off a Tevfri Plus as well, which you can't do with Cancel. Of course, um, yes. And the big thing is I couldn't play any disdainful strokes in the main deck because if you're playing against mono blue tempo, you have literal zero targets. And if you're playing against mm. mono red, it's basically just frenzy. Um, yep. But what's interesting is that the ag- aggressive decks are all playing a lot of non-creature spells. So the negates aren't blank. Like, you have no idea how many history of banalias I've counted on turn two on the draw with negate. <laughs> uh, and yeah. that card, not, that, not letting that card resolve is massive. That card is an absolute pain. Uh, I'm sick of playing against it already. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, well, this is it. You can you can either take two of it and clarry on a turn later, and at that point your opponent's possibly done something more annoying that you're going to have to deal with as well, or you take ten off it. Yeah, it's not, it's in, not like absurd, you know, absurd mass like that. You're absolutely right. Um, and like even against like the red decks, they play what twelve burn spells and four risk factors and experimental frenzy. So the game isn't even mm. blank against the mono red deck. Um, it's mm. like it's just kind of blank against the white weenie decks basically. And that's, ba- yeah. that's basically it. And some of them even play like I've seen this playing a giant and things like that too. So um, yeah, essentially uh, the two cost count spells deal with everything. Uh, Syncopate is a really good bridge between your rats and your planeswalkers. Um, mm. And the other thing I noticed about a lot of the Jeskai control lists is how loads of them had cut Settle the Wreckage. The the Wilson Mock deck, the top eight of the G play, was playing zero in the 75. And I was like, you just, yeah. do you just want to die to a Dante Van card? Like, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Yeah, no, absolutely. That was, I think that was something that over the last couple of weeks I've gotten really, like, weirded out by, in fact, because it you you used to be, you know, I was a black red player last season. I was, I was the enemy. And it was just like, okay, turn four. How many creatures can I afford to lose to a Settle the Wreckage? Because mm. I have to do that mm. maths every turn yeah. four. Yeah, yeah, now yeah. it's like, oh, turn them sideways. Like, it doesn't... But... Were people not playing settles because they knew people were going to play around settle anyway? So it actually freed up space in their deck that people were going to play around a spell they didn't have. I I don't know because I mean I still think settling against green black is pretty useful because you just go you know all that recursion that you do and the nonsense that you're planning on doing against my control deck to beat me in the late game. Yeah, you're not allowed to do any of that because it's, it's not going so into big. the graveyard. It's so you, have to, you have to exile Carnage Tyrant. It has to. It has to go. It literally has to go. Yes. Otherwise, you will die to it. Like I just, yeah, I, the first Carnage Tyrant gets cast three times against control decks a lot exactly. of the time. Exactly, it has to get exiled. And um, the other important part of Settle the Red Cage is you have to exile Fleet Wing. Oh, sorry, Fleet, um, Arclight Phoenix. Mm. And the Danto mm. Vanguard. Like, there's so many things where exile is relevant, and especially against the recursion yeah. of Golgari, but also you know recursion of the Phoenix and their indestructible creatures in the format still, even without Hazaret. So yeah. I don't see why people were cutting Settle the Wreckage at all to begin with. And I don't like playing Seal Away and Ixlan's Binding because I actually think there's a lot of matchups where the um, the Destroy Artifacts and Charm mode on cleansing Nova is kind of relevant yeah. yes yes agreed absolutely agreed so no I mean as as you were saying your your primary premise of like the four cost draw spells being bad and I'm like I get that because last season that was that was how I played against controlling you go turn four okay I can attack and if they settle me, I get to cast my spells for free and they haven't drawn any any cards. I can attack. If they don't settle me, I can cast my spells. And if they counter my spells, they can't draw any cards. And they've gone one for one. And they keep having to go one for one while my board is still attacking them. Or <laughs> they can take the damage and let my spell resolve and only draw two cards. At which point, they have to find something incredible to beat me. Yeah. And I just go, okay, turn four, I'm going to have to make sure that I've got a decent board presence and a decent threat to play. But other than that, I'm golden. Exactly, exactly. Um, You're absolutely right. If you'd spoken to someone, you know, 15 years ago and told them people would be playing Inspiration in, ty- in Type 2, they would laugh in face. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, and the interesting thing is, is that in the list that I that I was playing at the weekend was that basically your draw engines all cost two mana, and then you play them on turn two, you wrath the board turn three, four, and five, and you don't have to bo- you you don't have to bother thinking about your card advantage anymore because all you're doing is interacting for the rest of the game, and then paying one for scribe with a treasure map and cracking clues on your end step. And then also obviously your yeah. planeswalkers have the dual purpose of both interacting with the board and also drawing cards as well. So mm. you don't essentially waste any slots on card draw. No, absolutely. I was I was actually going to say um, yours is the first list in a very long time that I've seen playing two search for Azkanta. If if I've seen it at all, it's been one of. I don't. And I, I think I, that's kind of crazy. Anyone know the rationale as to why people were cutting it? People have told me that they were cutting it. I've not had I've not heard anyone defend it. I, I've heard no. people say it's bad, but not an explanation as to why it's bad. I mean, yeah, I don't know how much. That's... I don't know how much of Jeff Hoagland streams you've watched, but whenever anyone says a makes a comment about a, a deck or a card, he goes, "Why?" You, if you want to make a yeah. point, explain your reasoning for that point. Don't just throw yes. out statements into the dark without explanation. Because I love Search yeah. Cancer, I would never stop playing it. It's you know, you could, when you play your card draw spell on turn two, and you have to think about it for the rest of the game, and it's so abs- the interaction with Teferi is so absurd as well. Like I don't get it. Yeah. I don't get it at all. Um, um, no, presumably, I mean, this is sorry. Carry on, Simeon. You have two search and four treasure map because treasure maps you can play more than one mm-hmm. at a time. Correct, yeah. and, and also because the, search, 
it's all, it's not on diminishing returns at all because actually increase its value increases as you draw more because of the interaction with Khan and Tezzeret. Yeah, mm, yeah, exactly. Um, I was actually going to say like the the search for Azkanta as early draw with Teferi to back up, uh, backed up by some counter spells and some amount of removal is like that's that's what the Jeskai control deck in modern is mm-hmm. doing, yeah. and you know. If you can play a modern deck in standard, you play a modern deck in standard because the power level is almost always higher than anything yep. else going yep. on in standard. Absolutely. So the fact that people were taking it out and I didn't hear a proper defense for losing them and it just, it felt like a lot of people were doing it because other people were doing it and no one had, had heard the rationale like, oh yeah, not many people were playing it at the Pro Tour. It's like, okay, but why didn't they play at the Pro Tour? Did they not play at the Pro Tour because they felt on turn two they could never get away with cast? it because they had to have interaction for mono red or mono white at which point you're going they were building to a very specific meta game Mm -hmm. or were they not playing it because they thought it was bad and why on earth did they think it was bad (laughs) and it's just it's just like this this thing as you say as as jeff hoagland puts it why i want to know why if you throw out a statement into into the world if you know justify it ls lsv says x card is good in limited ben stark says x card is good in limited i'm gonna listen to him i really kind of still want to know why but i'm gonna just listen to him basically everyone else you're gonna have to explain yourself to correct correct um one last point i want to make on is the gold star award that goes to hawatley warrior poet which everyone had to read um, um <laughs> yeah this is I, the, I have no idea what it does I had people come so around is... other tables and walk over and go, what the hell is that card doing on the field? <laughs> and I'm like, why have you got dinosaur tokens in your deck box, Helena? Um, but yeah, uh, so the my reasoning for the inclusion of Hoatley uh, is three main reasons. Because it's uh, First of all, it's a life gain engine in the main deck. Um, mm-hmm. because the red, Against red, that's so important. Because they burn you out from, basically, it doesn't matter how far you think you've stabilised, you still die to Banefire. Um, yeah. The other reason is that the 3-3 three, three dinosaurs trade with basically every creature in Golgari apart from Golgari Findbroker and yeah. two of them trade with a Carnage Tyrant. <laughs> so, and, you know, making a 3-3 three, three every turn is pretty powerful. Uh, yeah. Second of all is that there are a lot of board states where the minus ability for minus two will clear the board state. So lots of times there'll yes. be a 3-2 Jade Light Ranger. I remember clearing a board state that was a Glow Spore Shaman and a Merfolk Bond Walker with no counters on it. Um, and just, like when you kill things and you're left with a Planeswalker, it feels like you've won the game already. Yes, absolutely. Um, for those of you who don't remember, this is the uh, Red White Huartley, not the, not the Green white one uh, mm-hmm. three red white for a five loyalty planeswalker i, I believe it starts at five no, it starts, yes. it starts no, at three. three starts at three oh yes of course it does yes yeah, sorry um starts at three goes up to five on its plus two which is you gain life equal to the greatest power amongst creatures you control which is helped out by its zero which makes a three three green dinosaur creature token with trample the trample is very relevant <laughs> I, I know I believe you because as, like mono white uh, the reason that Carnage Tyrant is still good against the white weenie decks is because they just go well I'm not allowed to take any more damage <laughs> at some point and, uh, <laughs> and eventually I have to put creatures under it and you have to put a lot more than one under it at this point and then it's uh, minus X so there's no ultimate as such but minus X quietly warrior opponent deals X damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures creatures dealt damage this way can't block this turn obviously that's uh, more that second part in that last line is more useful in an aggro deck but as you say just getting rid of x ones yeah is and, actually, and leaving a planeswalker sometimes mm-hmm. is so insane actually the um and the the actual can't block text is kind of relevant um the main oh, okay. the main problem that jess guy has with resolve with things that resolve is planeswalkers and it's been yeah. it's been very shown very well across the uh, like in the previous iteration of jess guy control i played in the last format i was playing our revelation so i cut seal mm. away and cleansing them i'm sorry and um cast out because you're dealing with planeswalkers was so difficult and there was like Chandra's and mm. Heart of Kieran's and Khan's all flying around and you just had to sweep up everything because not everything could be killed by you know by um whatever wrath we were playing at the time uh light and hostilities but you know what I mean um uh, uh, fumigate? fumigate fumigate that's the one yeah, that's yeah. Fumigate. yeah so the reason that Hoatley's minus is really good is that you make you make dinosaur tokens and then you get to essentially kill stop your opponent's creatures from blocking from defect protecting their planeswalkers and you get to pressure your opponent's planeswalkers which you don't usually get mm. to do 
in Jeskai when you're basically your removal for planeswalkers is Tefri and expansion explosion. Yes, yeah, no, absolutely. A, a resolved planeswalker feels like the hardest thing for any Jeskai deck to Correct, deal with yeah. at the moment. Despite the fact that you know Ixlan's binding is still a thing. I mean, that brings me on to is is. Is Ixalan's Binding only out of the deck because you're playing Cleansing Nova and you want that flexibility to still exist? I I have a love-hate relationship with Ixalan's Binding. Um, in general, I think four-cost removal spells that only hit one thing are a bit clunky. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't think that it's unplayable, and I certainly wouldn't... I certainly wouldn't... Um, uh, I wouldn't, like, write it off as a playable card in the archetype. I'm not tested with it very much, so I can't give you a more definitive answer than that. But my, mm. as in, again, my main reason for not including the enchantment removal was specifically because I like to be able to have the flexibility with Cleansing Nova. Okay, there's there's a couple more things that I'd like to talk to you briefly about this deck, um, mostly in the sideboard. Um, we've already mentioned the Disdainful Strokes. You've got the extra negates in there, again, good against control. You you do fairly standard things. You've got a Lyra Dawnbringer, you've got a Justice Strike, you've got an extra set with the Wreckage, an extra expansion explosion. And then you go into things that are a little less <laughs> common with Nexus of Fate. No, no. And then you go into things that I have literally never seen before. Um, oh, no, sorry. You you do also have Legion War Boss, which it's not frequent, it's, but it, it, it does exist. It's, it's a good plan. absurd in the Control Mirrors. Like, I used to play, yeah, I used I to play Tilanali Summoner, which was very, very good in the Control Mirrors, because you essentially you, you drew the game out, you played it on turn 10 or whatever, with three camp spells open, and if you untap with it, you won the game. For anyone who doesn't know, uh, Tilanali Summoner is a two-mana 1-1 one, one with Ascent, and when it attacks, you can play Red and X and make X-1-1 one, one attacking elemental tokens, which stick around if you have the City's Blessing. So if yes. you untap with it in the Control Mirror and you attack, you just get to make 12 one ones that stick around, and the game basically ends on the spot. Um, yeah. But the problem with Tilanali Summoner is that since decks have started ad- um, adapting with to Niv Mizzet and playing Niv Mizzet in the deck like two, three copies per sideboard or four if Adrian Sullivan and your maniac um, <laughs> he is a maniac but a lovely maniac I love him um, but the, uh, the essentially Tillan Summoner just dies to them drawing a card so it was kind of a bit ropey and a bit yeah. too slow but you just wanted something you can play on turn three and it wins the game in four turns and, and it did multiple times at the Stockport PCQ, I, P, PPCQ I got a lot of the final of I played it on turn three off a mulligan to five and it won the game on its own it's absurd so that brings me on to <laughs> The next card that I want to talk about, Sanguine Sacrament. So for those of you who don't remember, this is X, white, white. Uh, you gain twice X and put Sanguine Sacrament on the bottom of your library. Yeah. Okay. So. What, is is this purely like life gain to draw out a game against red? I don't understand. One word. Bane fire. Yeah, no, I get you. I do get you. <laughs> and not, it's not just against, it's not mostly not against the red decks. I feel like I can turn the corner okay against the red decks. The problem is the control mirror. Um, in that I was frequently just, I was getting to the point where I just ended up dying to bane fire. It happened all the time, mm. and I was, I, I hate bane. I am sick of losing to bane fire. I'm thoroughly, thoroughly <laughs> sick of losing to bane fire. Um, it's a bit obviously bringing it in against the red deck. It's very, very good against the red deck uh, because yeah. I draw a lot of cards and you have a lot of mana against the red deck. But what you don't have is a lot of time. Um, mm-hmm. because as I mentioned previously they can burn you out because they play Shock, Wizards Lightning, Lightning Strike, Risk Factor and Banefire uh, so no matter how long you think you've got you've always got a little bit less as you're no, you, even if you've stabilised you can still get burnt out because you don't keep in that many count spells um, although I do keep in negates when I think a lot of people might board out negates against red um, but yeah. you also just need something that puts the game away and uh, a lot of the time Sanguine Sacrament is the card uh, and the control where I've actually yeah. had people tap out for Banefire and I've responded by casting Sacrament Sacrament and they've been very very sad that's that's pretty <laughs> gross actually <laughs> that's pretty gross um i mean i was gonna say i i honestly think we'd see more of this if teferi had an extra word on the card yep. if teferi had the word another in its <laughs> second ability Correct, yeah. this this would be the thing that went back on the bottom of the library when you're winning with a teferi yeah absolutely, like, that absolutely. would be that would be the game plan um so yeah, it's an interesting include here. Like I say, I'm pretty certain you'd see more of it if if Teferi was, as far as I'm concerned, fixed. Um, I've had un- for, for then, what it's worth. I've had very good results with Sanguine Sacrament, and um, uh, on, okay, that's good to yeah. that's actually really good to hear. Yeah. So in yeah. general, I, it seems like a very kind of weird inclusion, but I've genuinely had good results with it, and I would recommend at least people trying it out in their Jeskai sideboards. Although there are obviously there are plenty of you know very kind of more conventional ways of being able to do that, which will probably get people good results as well. 
So the last card I want to talk about, I I kind of want to know if it works with Sanguine, Sanguine Sacrament, if that's <laughs> what you're going for here. Um, so, uh, Fire Song and Sun Speaker is your last card yes. in, in your sideboard. So this is, because I imagine most people will have forgotten this, this was actually the buyer box promo for Dominaria. So you've actually got two buyer box promos in this deck. You've got this and Nexus of Fate in I both do, in the I sideboard. Do. Um, so this is four red white uh, for a legendary creature Minotaur cleric. Uh, it's a four six creature, and the I feel the relevant text on it is probably red instants and sorcery spells you control have life link. But whenever an instant or sorcery spell causes you to gain life, fire song and sun speaker deal three damage to target creature or player. What was the thinking behind this card? Uh, was this, was this a wacky include or was this a really deeply thought out include? The red decks beat Lyra. Is the that's the reason I use included. In okay. the is that every, every, all the red decks know they lose to Lyra? They know you're playing Settle mm-hmm. the Wreckage, or at least they, they know you could be theoretically playing Settle the Wreckage. They all bring in they all bring in fight with fire. Um, and the, yep. the important part of Fire Song and Sunsbury is it has six toughness. Um, okay. So I'd spent a lot of time playing Jeskai and just watching my Lyra hit the bin. And I was like, well, how do we play around this? And Fire Song and Sunsbury is the perfect card because it doesn't die to fight with fire. If you cast a Deafening Clarion, the game ends on the spot. Uh, yeah. Because you know, you don't need to wipe the board and gain 9, 12, 15 life. You also get to attack four and gain four life as well. Um, yeah, and essentially, it's and, the level t- and deal three to something as well because because it's a white spell that's caused you to gain life. Not the uh, not quite the actual spell text has to have gain life on it. Um, oh, does it? Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. I thought they were meant to work together. I thought that was the point. Yeah, in, yeah, in the same way that in the same way that justice strike wouldn't make you gain life with fire song and sun speaker. Right. All right. Mm. Um, well, all right I mean, it's, it, it would have been would have been great if it did. It would have been amazing. But yeah, uh, yeah. essentially. It's the um. There's another. <laughs> I keep back to go to Jeff Hoagland, but I've watched him live a stream recently. This thing about sideboarding is you have to sideboard against the deck you're playing against in game two, not the, get- the yes. deck you played against in game one. And the, ga- the game two deck will have three copies of Fight with Fire in it, most likely. And your Lyra is going to die. Um. And I uh, yeah, I included Lyra already in, 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 as well because she's very very good against the Phoenix deck, which Fire Song and Sunbreaker is not. Um. But when you're playing yeah. your Treasure Map and all these different all these different you know search spells and things like that, you tend to, you tend to find your one ons a lot more often. Yeah. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I can believe that. And and hopefully you're just going to be digging through with, yeah, Treasure Map, Khan, Teferi. Tezzeret. Um, and Tezzeret, yeah, exactly. Um, um, so the w- only change I would make to the deck moving forward, literally the only change, I would take out the Nexus of Fate from the sideboard and I'd put in, okay. and I'd put in one copy of Spell Spindle. Okay. Yeah, all right. It's a, bit, it's a bit clunky to have in the main deck, but in the grinding mid range of control mirrors, if you counter a spell with it, you get to draw five cards or whatever. Yes. You... Yeah, because you've because you've made the treasures and then you've got the the treasure map flipped almost. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, you always have just random treasure coves hanging around. Um. So actually, I think spell spindle would be the last card I'd have in the sideboard. Um. Other than that, everything else in the deck seemed great. Uh. The yep. Uh. That wouldn't change any other card. I think. Um. Tezzer over oh, Tez, since Tezzer replaced Rallets overperformed. The Thopter's, if Thopter's relevant and the draw two cards is completely absurd. Um, yes. I, I think that if uh, speculators who are listening, I would buy your treasure maps now. It's absurd. It's so good. You get to... I, I yeah. will point out, I tried to buy some treasure maps last week. It was very difficult to find any. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, we get to put your head yeah. on mana and cards. It does everything. Like... Um, it's been yeah, uh, it's been so impressive. I'm even playing Treasure Map and Khan in my black green list as well. Yep, yeah, that's that's been something I've I've been thinking about for a long time now. Actually, mm-hmm. like Treasure Map works. I mean, obviously, it also works really lovely with um, Vraska it, Six it because does then indeed, you just make yes. extra treasures. Yeah, um, and that and that kind of thing. And I I actually really like Vraska Six. I know she's fallen out of favor in a lot of the the Golgari list, but I still really like I'm, her. It's just like I'm, big, a I'm a big fan, answer. big fan myself as well. Um, and also in the black green list with the Khans and with the treasure maps, uh, you get to play Phyrexian scriptures to break the mirror. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And actually exile the graveyard, which it's, seems oh, every every text really on the card important. is so relevant because you get to this point mm. where you have your constructs in play that don't die. The creature that you've pumped with um, Phyrexian scriptures that doesn't die. All your opponent's creatures die, and then obviously you've got this board state. And then you get to find broker back your Phyrexian scriptures, make a, your find broker artifact, and do it all again. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Just oh, such value. Um, and that's one of the yeah, one, of, one of the beautiful things about the standard format. It's a very, very good standard format. Um, in that even within archetypes, there are variations, and none of the variations mm. can go ever go that far wrong. And it's really interesting to yes. think about which variation you want to play for the 
MS game for a certain week. Which is why I'm really interested yeah. in what the new PCQ system is going to look like with this format. Uh, if it's if, it, mm. if the format stays like it is with the release of Ravnica Allegiance, and we still have this these these undefined these the archetypes are defined, but the variations within them are undefined, we'll get very very interesting PCQ results where creating the correct list for the weekend is going to be so important. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, as you say, though, it's it's very hard to have a deck that's like total garbage as long as you're vaguely within the, the parameters yeah. of of yeah exactly the shell um it's it's really weird because i said a very similar thing about team or energy mm-hmm. a couple of seasons ago and i said something quite similar about black red last season mm-hmm. basically like there's a lot of space here that you could still explore i'm not saying my version is the best version i'm saying it's the version i like playing when I mean, you look at autumn who took four copies of Wood- yeah. wild woodland wanderer and won nationals with it and no one was literally yeah. Yeah. zero people were playing that card i mean it makes it basics because autumn's the best magic player in the country but um well yes um but <laughs> she'd, she'd identified the meta game and she'd played the card within the within the she'd had the shell of the archetype but identified key parts to the variation good for the field for that weekend and you know won the tournament with it you actually see See, I, I always go back to this when I'm talking about people metagaming correctly and people pl- people um, preparing for tournaments in a smart manner, which they don't do for people mm. because you don't need to, um, was in when she first played the Pro Tour and she came 11th in Pro Tour Battle for Zendikar. She was playing Green White Megamorph. I don't know if you heard this story, but she mm. wasn't playing Gideon and Alex Zendikar in the main deck. Um, I don't know if you remember, remember this at all. Uh, I, I know she's mentioned it to me. I don't remember her reasoning. Essentially... People, there was this rumour going around that she was only pl- not playing Gideon because they thought she couldn't afford be- to buy Gideons, which is obviously absurd. Like, if you're going to go to the pro, yeah. you, do whatever you, do, you, do, you do whatever it takes. But she'd identified... And th- there that, were plenty of people who would have lent it to exactly, them, you exactly, know? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but essentially what she'd identified was that in the green-white Megamorph mirror match, the, the play draw is so, so important. You have to break the symmetry. And Gideon doesn't do mm. that. On the play, it wins the game. And on the draw, it's a 4 mana 2 that gains you 5 life. So it's a massively different on the play on the draw. Because you played Archangel. <laughs> tithes instead which breaks the symmetry by forcing your opponent to pay mana to attack you when you're on the draw um, and mm. essentially made you raid your wingmate rock first no matter whether you're on the play yeah. or the draw which is really really interesting and she'd clearly identified the way to break open mirror matches in a way that lazy magic players would not have done so yeah no, I, I think this sort of thinking is exactly what what is going to get give players like autumn the edge i mean we saw them take instead of lana elves when you know what yeah it's great when you play it on turn turn one and absolutely god awful when you play it on turn four through 20 so you know what we're going to play instead adventurous we're, we're impulse. Gonna play adventurous impulse which is fine on turn one to help you sort out your your deck that can occasionally look a little clunky and pretty much great on every turn post that because you're just drawing another creature because your deck is heavily creature mm-hmm. and they've ident- and like, they'd identified that yeah. when you're playing a, a format where having the right cards at the right time within your you know your variations of your archetype is so important that the card selection is what's key which is why cards Absolutely. like Adventurous yeah. Impulse and Treasure Map and all these kind of cards are so important in the format right now in my opinion no, I, I think I absolutely agree. Yeah, uh, and this sounds a similar thing to Alexander Gordon Brown with Wildgrowth Walkers at last season, going, yeah. I've identified what I need to do in this mirror, and I'm playing it, and everyone else is making fun of it, but it's working. Yes, yeah. Uh-huh. That was that was the best thing to, to see. It was like, yeah, I know everyone's taking the mickey at me. I still crushed them. Yeah, it was like, <laughs> like, yeah. It was like me playing Hour of Revelation in Jessica Control previous form, where everyone was kind of uh, already on board with the idea that you played Fumigate, and I played yeah. Hour of Revelation into my opponents elders who born and Liliana and it looked and you know people you know were surprised by this but it, it was yeah. it was probably people magic players the, I mean I've touched um, on this like many times with my friends in the the PPTQ system generates lazy magic play by not incentivizing people to meta games all you need to do is win five rounds of magic and suddenly you're in the top eight you know, well, get lucky actually you just need to win three rounds of magic yeah and you're in the top yeah, eight yeah if you exactly. win the first three yeah correct yeah so you don't, you don't have to really have to meta game whereas an eight round PTQ you get to you win the first five rounds and then the last three rounds you're playing against the people you otherwise be playing in top Hates and playing a good deck isn't good enough to get you to get you past them because they're at the same at the same or better play skill than you are. So you need something else. Um, yeah. And so what that means is, um, what was the point I was going to make uh, in the metagaming. In metagaming? And people, the la- when you play lazy decks, when you play the best decks, you don't you don't look at other cards in the format, and you you, know, you mm. cut corners, and you don't look at cards like Sanguine Sacrament or Hour of Revelation or Woodland Wanderer or um, 
or these other cards and things like that that people would have, otherwise would not have considered if you don't feel like well how do we go how do we go over the top in this matchup that I expect to play a lot of when all you need to do is go well, I'm going to play this list that's clearly very very powerful and be up on some of the local scrubs at the local PBCQ. <laughs> I mean this I mean, you 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 say it that way but that is a lot of what happens is you know a lot of a lot of these PPTQs are obviously we all know I'm I'm sure a lot of the listeners to the program will 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 know that you know a lot of the people who play at PPTQs will generally be at their local store and there'll be you know a group of 10 maybe 15 sometimes players who are literally traveling the country twice every weekend to play PPTQs and those players will, as you say, they'll get away with being lazy because they'll just be like, I am playing uh, a, a well-built deck that has been shown to be well-built by a pro player. And I know what I'm doing with it. And I know vaguely what's going on in the format. So the chances are I have a very good chance of top eighting. And those local players, if they're coming from an f and mentality rather than from a competitive mentality, a lot of them are going to be playing, you know, their builds, their, their, their inventions that haven't been tested. They haven't been through the machine. And while they may have brilliant ideas, because they haven't been able to boil those ideas down to something that really is consistent and is powerful all the time and does things against the format that need to be done, they're going to lose because, in general, they just haven't had the machine working for Correct. them. Correct. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You know, I, I turn up with the exact same 75 as Autumn. I know I'm in for a good chance of doing pretty well on the day because... It's it's a it's an awesome Bichette deck, you know. I'm not I, Though, exactly. I'd argue the other thing as well that the local players sometimes will turn up with the autumn Bichette deck, but they oh, yeah. ha- aren't used to the format and so they have no idea how to sideboard it properly, mm. and mm. don't and so therefore don't win because of that as well. They either have their yeah. own brew that they have that hasn't gone through the testing process, or they've gone they've literally net decked and gone. Oh, I'll take this seventy five because it's done well, and not looked yeah. at how to play and it. I, or I'm I'm very guilty of that as well i am very guilty of going oh it's a jerry t deck it'll be fine oh it's a todd anderson deck it'll be fine you know turning up on the day of the tournament and getting absolutely smashed because i didn't know what i was doing you know and and this is not to say that local players are are all scrubs and they're all that, not yeah playing that's not right it's not everyone whatever. this is definitely not what we're saying but i'm saying that in general when you find those players it will be at pptqs because it's their local store and yeah, they might exactly, as well go exactly. down for a day of magic whereas as you say if it's a PTQ, yes, you'll still get a few local players, but you will get nowhere near the percentage of well, people. That also depends people on traveling. That also depends on what the entry level for PTQs is. True, true. This which is, this we don't true. know. We still yet. don't. We still don't know what the system's going to be. We're still waiting for next week to even know yeah, what that's exactly. going to be. But and if I have one piece of advice I have for the budding competitive players out there, is that just playing your local tournaments and playing, you know, playing jamming games as standard is not good testing. It's it's all fine. It'll, it'll do the job. But you have to find the testing team, testing partners, play games, change sideboards, change archetypes, change strategies and look at the format and test specific things to be able to improve where you're going with your deck. If you just play games of magic against people at your local game store, it's not good enough to be able to test that little bit further to be good enough to play to 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 to, 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 um, to reach the higher echelons of competitive play. Absolutely. I think this is this is something that's a very key point actually. Um it's uh, you don't get to see those small what those small changes really do against a specific deck you're trying to build to beat. If you play against the same deck twenty times in a row, just you and your friends who are you know testing this this exact matchup, and you are changing like two or three cards each time. You get to see what's going exactly. on. If you're playing a league on Magic Online, a F and M every week, you know you're you doing four to five rounds of Magic and going, oh, okay, the deck the deck did pretty well this week. You know, I went I went four and one, or I went three and two, or whatever. You don't see why. You don't see where a card was good versus where a card was bad. You know that flourish, uh, that flower flourish looked insane when you went March of the Multitudes into Flower Flourish. Is it still okay when you don't get to do that? And the answer is yes. By the way. But it's you know that that kind of thing is worth looking exactly, at exactly and... exactly and in general uh, and I that's... think both of them have their place. Like what's good about mm. playing loads of local events or loads of leagues on Magic Online is you learn a lot about your own deck. You learn a lot about yes. what things you're losing to, and you get to um, see a variety of matchups and try and get an, an idea of where your position is. But you don't get to properly go through the minutiae of each matchup and build, and you don't get mm. to tune your deck in the way that you need to to be able to be successful at these larger seven, eight round events. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, to bring it all back to, to Autumn again, Autumn and J.D. and Klimporans were apparently basically just locked themselves in a basement for about a week and a half mm-hmm. and just jammed no, three matches. three days, but okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> but just jammed matches against each other until they finally finished their list out. And that was that was their testing because they knew that the person sitting opposite them would be a competent pilot of whatever deck you put in their hands and you would get a feel for what cards mm-hmm. were mm-hmm. good slash bad and what lines you should be taking in certain positions. And that kind of thing is is exactly where testing occurs as opposed to playing. Yeah. Playing's great. Playing is why we, we play magic, but if you want to get better and build a better deck, mm-hmm. testing is what you do. Right. I think with that, we should tell people where they can go and take their decks. Oh, before mm. we do that, we should oh, check we should in do a modern check. I guess yes. if we, if we must. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, there is Liverpool coming up, so it's quite touché, important that we touché, get some modern. Touché. It is uh, GP Liverpool, as you mentioned, Simeon, uh, coming up and already booked out. So if you're going, good luck. But we've got some information for you. Thanks to Harlequins in Preston for running their amazing monthly modern. Um, the hundred pound prize winner was a Jesco control deck the box winner was a green black rock deck uh, the rest of the top eight was made up by an eldrazi list um, naya burn blue white spirits bat spirits gift storm and another naya burn list so pretty interesting there two spirits decks two burn decks a combo deck um, a control deck a rock deck and then eldrazi because eldrazi if you um, asked me, we'll, would I think that a mid-range deck and a control deck would have met in the final at a modern event, I would have said that you were kidding. This is interesting. Yeah, exactly. This It's really unusual, actually, to see this sort of thing. Um, actually, the whole meta game is, like, surprisingly heavy on the fair decks. Yeah. Uh, we've yeah. got four, four spirits decks. We've got three blue-white X control lists, uh, three burn lists, three human lists, two Eldrazi, a Jund... Two combo companies. Uh, then we've got that rock deck. Uh, these are all one offs now. Uh, we've got a rock deck, storm, the storm deck, a dredge. Um, only a one off there again. Interesting to see that only one of those is being played, even with its its power increase. Apparently, uh, Titan Shift Nahiri combo. These are you know obviously where we're getting combo. Soul Sisters, Owling Mine because you've got to meme sometimes. Uh, Grixis Pyromancer, Amulet Titan, which is the most insanely hard deck to pilot I've ever seen in my life. A Tron player keeping up the keeping up appearances there. A Mill deck and Affinity. So it's um, a very very actually very fair field. Um, probably actually very mm. well placed for Jeskai Control, which is not thing I'd ever thought I'd say about modern as a format. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. It does feel like modern is dominated by turn three and turn four kills. Especially now that um, Hollow One has started playing uh, the Arc- Phoenix. Arclight Phoenix, yeah. Arclight I mean, to, Phoenix, yeah. For example, my, my potential lineup for GP Liverpool before I couldn't realise I couldn't play the main event was going to be Storm, Dredge and KCI. <laughs> <laughs> Ow. You, did you Were you playing planning on calling your your team a uh, single player game or something yeah, com- competitive <laughs> solitaire yeah <laughs> People, yeah, there's exactly. A, there's a running joke in the trading discussion group where someone will ask them about opinion on their modern deck, and I just post a picture of Solitaire and go, "What about my modern deck?" <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, interesting, inter- um, very interesting field. Um, very interesting. Um, you speak about Army Amulet Titan. My, my friend James Ball, who's playing the Amulet Titan deck, um, he played against. So, a, show me a screenshot of someone on Magic Online. If, if you play Imprisoned in the Moon on a Primeval Titan, if you Vesuva the land Primeval Titan, it enters the battlefield. Okay. As a primeval titan. As a creature. And then gets two more Vesuvas, which copy primeval oh titan. God. Which gets some That's insane. Vesuvas. It's hilarious. It's very hilarious. That's completely mental. It's hilarious. That is completely mental. It's not good, but um, it's funny. No, but it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> But I digress. Oh, I, I love digress. it. Um, yeah. Prison did the moon tech. Love it. What, um, what would you folks be playing in modern? Were you playing at the GP? If if I was allowed to play everything, uh, like if I had everything available, I I think I'd still be playing humans. Like yeah. you've got an enough interaction to occasionally stymie the the really broken things. 
but you're pressuring enough that control and mid-range, sometimes you just get under them. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's really powerful. And I'm assuming, Simeon, you'd be playing Tron, Tronning people on turn uh, three. It's the, o- it's the only deck I know how to play in modern, so it would <laughs> yep, have to be fair. Tron. Uh, I would um, probably play yeah. Grishol Brand, um, just because I love turn two combo decks, and also I want to punish people for playing modern. It's like, you, you, sh- <laughs> you, you showed up to this tournament, you're going to get turn two. <laughs> you did this to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so, so as it is, I'll be turning up to Liverpool, but only playing side events. Likewise, so, um, likewise. Yes. See you in standard absolutely, then. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, standard and then possibly some legacy, but mostly probably standard. Yeah, no, f- fair enough, fair enough. Um, right then, so we should talk about... Um, oh, sorry, uh, thank you again to uh, uh, Holocaust Preston. Uh, they will be having another monthly Mega Modern, but obviously the date now clashes with Christmas, so we will be hearing about that um, probably closer to, to January time. Um, let's talk about what events are coming up, people. Uh yes. This weekend, what you could be doing is you could be playing out the RPTQ in Glasgow at Geek Retreat. So good luck to anyone who managed to win their modern PPTQ and is going to that. Uh, if you aren't, on Saturday the 1st of December... Oh, when did it when did it get that close to the end of the year? Um, you could be at The Hobbit Hole in Chatteris. You could be at Patriot Games in Sheffield, Rooksburg's Realm in Western Supermare, Bus Stop Toy Shop in Largs, or Robin's Hobby Calf in Belfast. Simeon, how about that Sunday? On Sunday the 2nd, you could be at Geek Retreat in Birmingham or Geek Retreat in Glasgow. And we think possibly Forbidden Planet in Croydon, but I still haven't actually seen any advertising for that event. So definitely check with the organisers before also, going. Also, Absolutely. also for fans of Sealed, there's also a Sealed PPTQ in Fanboy 3 in Manchester on a Saturday. Oh, right. Yep, absolutely. Uh, if you're if you're liking the Sealed format, as we said, the limited format has looked quite fun. It's all right. Um, um, it's, not... it's, a, it's a shame we had no coverage at Warsaw, but, you know, you get what you get. Um, Boros is good. Um, the three colour decks are fine. Uh, it's a fine limited format. Not my, not my favourite, but I do like it. Fair enough. Um, there's also another um, event going on in Horsham that I, I feel I should mention. There's a local modern event going on. Now, this is an unsanctioned event. Um, it's being run by a group that has basically their local store closed down and they're keeping their own magic scene going, which I think is excellent. So I wanted to give a big shout out to the uh, MTG Horsham uh, group over on Facebook. If you search Horsham MTG Modern Event on Facebook, book um you'll see it's on sunday um rsvp on facebook and they will be giving out prizes based on attendance um like i say i think that's a a good way to support a local group that are fighting through not having a a store to actually you know sanction events for them at the moment so if you're looking for modern in the southeast do uh do give them a check out for the sunday um right then helena i think we know what the answer would be but what would you be playing this weekend uh, yep, yeah, I'd run back the same list with the spell swind instead of the next same seventy four other than that. Um, if not, uh, you don't want to play a control deck. I would play blue red drakes. I think the um, Pascal Viren deck is a very good place to start. I like the control and build with the Marari Conjecture in it quite a lot. Yes, no, the Marari Conjecture has looked uh, surprisingly good actually. Yeah. Yep. Simeon, what would you be on? Um, I have to say, Helen that sold the list incredibly well uh, I would be <laughs> likely to go there if I had all the cards yes. which I don't and so I will have to stick with Celestia Midrange and I'll definitely stick with Midrange rather than going back to tokens even though we've seen another tokens list make a top 8 I do like where the Midrange list sits uh, partly because it runs Khan and Treasure yep. Maps I, I yeah. thought it's worth I looked at your list and I really really liked it I thought the Venerated Lockstone looked sort of a bit out of place but other than that I really like the list and that's why they've come out the list okay. what are you playing instead? <laughs> I'm currently trying uh, Conclave Cavalier. Oh, okay, no worries. Oh, okay. Good. What, what, what would you play Khan. instead? Because, uh, again, don't own Fawn Khan, but sure. I, I, if I, I, I did, I possibly could go to Fawn Khan. I don't like Conclave Cavalier. Um, I think there's too many lava coils around for you to gain value. That is a fair that's, comment. That's actually. a fair point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I, I was frustrating. I, I, I love the card. It's 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 it was it was it Elf Coil Engine, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that is the best nickname for that card, actually. Yeah. 
Um, um, but if so, you can find yeah, them, I, I would play more copies of Khan. Um, it does everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not not going to necessarily disagree with that. Yeah. Um, I might, it's it's unfortunate. If I was if I was doing London, I could possible. lend them to you. Yes. Yeah, that would work. Um, as I say, it, it's just unfortunate that I'm not in London. I'd, I'd lend them to you, Simeon. But uh, as it is, um, I'm a little bit out of the way at the moment. For you First, to I need to see whether I'm up. actually whether I'm actually going to event. It looks like Geek Retreat in Birmingham is the only one I might be able to make. If I am, I will see what I can do about getting extra cons. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, what would you play if for? I were going to an event, I, if I was going to an event this weekend, I, I'd be starting. I, I'd go back to Autumn seventy five. Actually, I would go back to that because I keep tweaking it and I keep tuning it and I keep getting more and more annoyed with the list. Like I, I started with the. Uh, the Lanor Elves and then I saw Autumn's list from the PT I'm like okay cool Lanor Elves come out and then I watched Brad Nelson play it and he's like look it's Mox Emerald and I'm like yeah it does seem pretty good so I put it back in and I went yeah it does seem pretty bad and took it back out again and... what, what's your, what, so, what problems are you having with the black green list at the moment? Um, at the moment, it's it's realistic. So I'm actually playing a four wild growth walker in uh-huh. the main version. So it's as soon as I hit that against a red deck, they either have to waste removal on it, at which point I feel like I've got reasonable value, or it just takes over the game and they die. At how, which point? How are you? Insane. How are you finding the mirror match? Uh, the mirror match is see, I love it because it's super grindy and and really intricate. But I could do with a I could do with a mirror breaker. I'll be honest with you. Primal I think is the best mirror breaker in the black green mirror I found. Tetsumo, uh, uh that's the reveal it from your hand, put a counter, yeah, a prey counter. Yeah. I, I watched that, someone the pass the same Tetsumok three times in the green black mirror. It was absurd. Oh, oh that value. And, Oh, that that's so much value. That's so and rich. And it trades with Carnage oh. Tyrant, even if they've cast Finality. Of course, because it's a death touch for reasons. Yes, well, probably for that reason. <laughs> but yeah, that would be my that, that would be that would be my mirror break. If you don't like Tetsmok, then I play Hatchery Spider. Okay, because what I was actually thinking of was um, switching it up and going into the uh, the treasure map and Khan version. The problem yeah. that I have with that is One I don't us. necessarily One know. Us. Yes, <laughs> I don't necessarily know how I'm then dealing or surviving through the early game of um, things like the Is It Drake's deck. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think you know it's it's some some interesting. Uh, finicking that I think I need to do. It some... needs plenty of testing because all these mid range, de- oh, these, yeah. these kind of, these kind of, um, these mercurial mid range lists always need to be tested and thoroughly tuned. Um, oh, absolutely, and and because every because they pivot so much on basically every card choice, mm-hmm. like it's like you say, it's very important to get the testing in with the mid range yeah. lists. Um, you know, an aggro list is still going to aggro, a control list is still going to control, but it will control slightly differently as your as your mostly wrath. Mm-hmm. deck shows yeah. but the mid-range uh, deck have to have the ability to pivot based on the matchup and having the exactly. having the right nuance within your deck list is very very important uh, one thing I'm playing in my green black list I'm actually playing Thorn Lieutenant uh, as it's worse in the mirror match but better against red and better against control because um, yeah. control it's always a live top deck because it can just be like a 6-7 six, six, or a 10-11 uh, yeah, and against exactly. the red deck it only dies to shock and wizards lightning and still leaves behind a friend if they do yeah yeah no absolutely um, right then I think with all that Helena where can people find you to talk about the magical cards so I'm on Facebook at Helena Break um, Phil, I'm always open to um, direct messages on Facebook from people who are nice um, you can find me on Twitter <laughs> at no underscore justice underscore MTG um, and I think that's basically it I don't have a Twitch account um, so basically only those two methods um, it's basically just like leftist politics and magic the gathering so the only two things I have interest in uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny because uh, yeah I describe mine very similar <laughs> Whereas mine would just be Magic Gathering. Yeah, you stick to the magic, don't you, Sim? That's that's pretty good. Where can people find you, Simeon? Uh, I am at Simeon B M T G and Jack. I am at Jack Patton forty two. Um, if you'd like to look at any of the deck lists from this week that we spoke about, or indeed any of the other seasons, and we'll also be putting our guest lists up, obviously. Um, uh, please do head over to standardintelligence.uk. Um, if you'd like to talk to us about anything longer form, standardpattern at gmail.com is the email address to send them to. Um, and once again, we will be doing our drawing next week. So you've got until the 4th of December to sign up to our Patreon to get a chance at winning a playset of 
of a standard legal magic card that we think is quite powerful. Um, if you would like to be, <laughs> if you would like to be no uh, involved in that draw, <laughs> please do head over to patreon.com forward slash SICast. Um, Helena, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, and thanks, congratulations so thank once again. Me. And to everyone out there, stop playing cancel. <laughs> <laughs> I think on that note it's time to say thank you all very much for Cheers. listening. Till next time. And we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye.